Good, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Loose Talk in Public Places, the 2019 Thorn Harbour Health Hypothetical. My name is Simon Ruth, and I'm the CEO of Thorn Harbour Health. <clears throat> I'd like to open the event by acknowledging uh, that we are tonight on the traditional lands of the peoples of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also acknowledge uh, the various present and past board members of Thorn Harbour Health that are in the room. Tonight is our fifth annual hypothetical, and our first is Thorn Harbour Health. At our 35th anniversary this year, we rebranded from the former Victorian AIDS Council. In, in doing so, acknowledged the many thousands of volunteers who over 35 years have helped create the organisation we are today. Thorn Harbour Health exists solely for the betterment of Victoria and South Australia's LGBTI and HIV communities. Specifically, our name acknowledges two key activists. Alison Thorne, who as a young queer activist stormed the stage at a public meeting and called for the formation of the AIDS Council and Keith Harbour, who, in addition to establishing the Melbourne branch of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, was an early president of our organisation prior to succumbing to the AIDS virus himself. Activism and protecting our LGBTI and HIV communities are in our blood. This week, Thorn Harbour Health has launched a new website tackling drinking cultures within our lesbian, bisexual and queer women's communities called Rethink the Drink, and you may have already seen the You Couldn't Do That With a Hangover campaign. We are campaigning against the proposed ban on amyl and poppers, and for more information on that, you can go to our website or pick up one of the flyers at the back of the room. Uh, we have launched a New Look Drama Down Under campaign, which for the first time moves away from one face and features a new range of face and bodies. Um, we will this week also be launching a video on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis for trans and gender diverse women, and another video on prep on demand, otherwise known as event-based dosing. In this same venue next Tuesday night, uh, as you will have seen on your seats, our friends at Switchboard have an exciting event called Speak Up, I Can't Hear You, a panel discussion of, of storytelling in our communities with Lou Bennett, Christos Cholkis and Carolyn De Cruz. And for information on that, you can go to either Switchboard or Midsummer's websites. Tonight's hypothetical is being broadcast on Channel 31 and on Facebook Live, so hello to all of our viewers at home, including my mother. Um, and our audience here with us, uh, welcome, and please put your mobile phones on silent. Over five years, we have taken you into the bedrooms of Mardi Gras, into the corridors of power in the Australian government in 2022, to the scene of a murder at Mount Buggery and into a public housing estate in outer space last year, leaving only one place left for us to go this year, and that is onto Melbourne's iconic tram network with loose talk in public places. So it's my very great pleasure to start introducing our wonderful panel for tonight's proceedings, and this is our first ever all queer panel. So our first panellist, he's entertaining in and out of drag. He's a photographer and a radio host on Joy 94.9. He's a singer, a journalist and an advocate, and in his own words, he's a very busy homosexual. Please welcome Dean O'Curry. Uh, joining us once again after a much talked about performance last year, please welcome the Victorian Government Member for Eastern Victoria in the Legislative Council, Harriet Sheen. Okay, he's a broadcaster, a podcaster, an educator, and an agitator. He's a multi award winning journalist and an enough HIV stigma ambassador. Please welcome back to the panel for the third time, Dean Beck. And we will try not to confuse our two deans as the evening goes on. Um, they are dedicated, uh, they have dedicated their life to social justice and they are a passionate and committed CEO of Switchboard Victoria. Please welcome Joe Ball. The, the panellists aren't sitting in the order that they're coming onto stage, so this is their first you know, challenge for the evening to find their seats. 
Uh, she's the former Executive Director of the Northern Territory AIDS and Hepatitis Council, an outspoken advocate for the health and wellbeing of our communities, and at a previous hypothetical, she even ended up the Prime Minister of Australia. Please welcome Kim. <laughs> They are a passionate advocate for LGBTIQ plus rights and they are the Director of Legal Advocacy at Australia's first national LGBTIQ plus legal advocacy organisation, Equality Australia. Please welcome Lee Carney. He is an HIV activist and outspoken advocate for people living with HIV, both in Australia and internationally. He's been living with HIV for 30 years himself, and he's also a life member of Thorn Harbour Health. Please put your hands together for Paul Kidd. And our final panellist, she's a writer, a performer, an artist, and a comedian. Her show, Trigger Warning, won the 2016 Barry Award, the Golden Givo, and two Green Room Awards. Please welcome the ridiculously talented Zoe Coombsma. And now for tonight's moderator. She's a comedian, a singer, a speaker. She's best known for her work as the lead singer of the musical comedy group The Axis of Awesome, her amazing TED talk on anxiety, and her campaign to change the day of Australia to May the 8th, mate. Uh, please welcome, for the very first time in a midsummer hypothetical, Jordan Raskopoulos. Kiss on the microphone. I don't need that. I've got one here. Um, and you, it, I put a lot of extra A's in the word mate on that thing. I said, mate, mate, mate. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Uh, it is so good to be here. Uh, and I'm going to outline uh, quickly the, uh, the format of tonight's hypothetical. Uh, there is a new form of intimacy that happens every day. And sometimes it can be scary. It seems like everyone's private moments, their personal rituals and intimate habits, can be enacted on public transport. Without fear, favour, embarrassment or shame, it's possible to overhear the details of last night's sexual adventure, the ins and outs of, of an ongoing relationship and the tumultuous roller coaster of a breakup, all between two or three train, tram or bus stops. We're going to follow the conversation between some acquaintances on the 67 tram out of the city as it winds its way down to Kilda Road. And here are our happy travellers to introduce themselves. Oh, hi everyone, I'm Janice Plackett from HR <laughs> and I'm a patriotic Australian. I love MasterChef, Antiques Roadshow and the Channel 9 News. You know, <laughs> some people have described me as uh, a bit old fashioned, but they're bigots. <laughs> I'm actually very broad-minded. I believe in traditional Aussie values, a fair go for all, and everyone looking after their own backyard. <laughs> I don't really go in for politics. It doesn't really affect me. And as long as the Queen is still on the $10 note, then there's no need for a stupid republic. <laughs> what nonsense. <laughs> That's enough about me for now. You'll learn more as we go on. Too, Roo. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Barker. I used to work in HR with Janice. I'm a 28-year-old millennial with bad tattoos, whitened teeth and a bleached anus. <laughs> I love RuPaul's Drag Race, Troy Sivan and Poppy. <laughs> Don't know who she is? Google it. I'm all about the Greens. I love the Greens. I love all their policies. I think all their policies are really good about, you know, stuff. <laughs> and I would love to pash Adam Bent just once. Uh, now, I use Tinder for intimate, meaningful dates and Grindr for intimate, meaningful hookups. Uh, my Tinder profile describes my interests such as dancing, gin and tonics and honest conversations. And my Grindr profile describes my interests such as barebacking, water sports and felching. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's enough for me for now. Perfect. All right. Uh, so basically, th these guys are, are cartoons, right? But they might not be too far from the truth of some people we actually know. Um, as their conversations uh, progress over the night, we're going to hear this bell. Yeah, like on a tram. Um, 
And uh, when that bell, we're going to freeze the action so that our panellists can consider the issues raised in the conversation. Okay, so uh, let's listen in as they make their first journey home. <laughs> I thought it was you, but you know, you can never be too sure. <laughs> How are you? Hi. Hi, Jan. It's great to see you. Wow, look at your hair. You've, you've done something to your hair. My hair? No. No, I haven't. It's Janice, actually, not Jan. I hate Jan. Right, okay. Well, it's Mark, actually, not Matt. Oh. I don't know who Matt is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> are you uh, still in the same place with, um, oh, God, what was his name? Jason or Janie? Was Jake. It? It's Jake. Oh, did you end up getting married? I know you're really big on that. God, when you're in the office, you never shut up about it. <laughs> I think by the time that vote thing happened, though, you'd already left. Uh, no, actually, we're not together anymore. And we weren't planning on getting married anyway. Oh, well, what a wasted effort all that was then. <laughs> oh, well, you got your own way, though. It was actually quite a great day, Jan. I felt really proud to be an Australian that day. Did you? It's Janice, actually. But how weird. I always feel proud to be an Australian. It's like a hobby of mine. Yeah. But I was sad when they announced that marriage thing because at the end of the day, it's really about the kiddies, isn't it? You know, what's good for them, protecting their needs and their rights. I mean, forcing little boys into dresses, what nonsense. Oh, and those poor bakers having to bake all those weird wedding cakes. I feel for them, I really do. I think, and this isn't just my opinion, but I think they should be able to make a stand. Oh, lol, a cake stand. <laughs> but really, it is a free country and everyone's rights need protecting. Okay. Um, so Janice uh, has got, given us a lot to think about there. Uh, and of course, there has been uh, some precedent-setting cases around the world, uh, including a bakery uh, which refu refused to bake a cake featuring Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street with the slogan, Support Gay Marriage, for gay rights activist Gareth Lee, who then sued for discrimination on the grounds of sexual, sexual orientation and political beliefs. Ultimately, a unanimous UK Supreme Court judgment ruled that the baker did not refuse to bake the cake on the basis of Mr Lee's sexual orientation. So I presume it was copyright infringement. Um, <laughs> Uh, as they would have refused to bake the cake for, uh, with, with such mes messaging for anyone, irrespective of their sexual orienta orientation. So, uh, Zoe, there you are, is uh, Janice onto something here? Uh, yeah, look, I like her. Uh, <laughs> that was a joke, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, you know, at least I, I feel like um, Janet, well, she speaks with conviction, uh, that special conviction that can only really come with sort of complete ignorance. Uh, it's kind of the same tone that I feel like I, I heard my year nine religion teacher use when she told me heaven is a city roughly the size of Sydney. <laughs> True story. But I mean, she is onto something, isn't she? I mean, everyone's rights should be protected, and uh, those poor little boys being forced to wear dresses. What's no one should be forced to wear anything they don't want to wear especially if it doesn't align with their gender identity. So, um, you know, she's onto something there. But I, I, I want to address the elephant in the room, which is the, the Bert and Ernie cake, mm -hmm. um, which is that Bert and Ernie are gay. So uh, it's canon. We all know that. <laughs> so refusing to bake a gay Bert and Ernie cake is kind of like refusing to make a Calamity Jane strap-on. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I suppose any, what you're saying is any Bert and Ernie cake is going to be a gay Bert and Ernie cake. It is, yeah. yeah. So they're already probably doing it by default, so okay. why not, you know, call a spade Put a spade? spade. Okay. Just... Um, Lee, uh, is it discrimination for suppliers to refuse service? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the laws in different countries are obviously a bit different. Um, sometimes it's really confusing when we have cases from overseas and sometimes they're decided on really technical means. I am a lawyer, so it, sometimes they do get really difficult. But really what it comes down to is should you be turned away because of who you are? And for some reason we have laws in this country that allow people to be turned away from religious organisations because of who they are or who they love in ways that we would never accept on other grounds, on the basis of your race or because you have a disability or because of your age. 
These are laws that we need to change, but what we don't have here is a blanket allowance for commercial supplies of goods and services to turn you away because you're LGBTIQ. Mm. But you can still some, turn someone away for being a dickhead. <laughs> yes. Good. <laughs> Paul, uh, are religious freedoms an inherent right? Um, I think they are. Religious freedoms are certainly something that need to be protected. Mm -hmm. um, but religious freedom means the freedom to practice your religion and to believe what you want to believe. It's not the freedom to refuse other people's service because you disagree with their lifestyle. Um, as far as Bert and Ernie uh, on a cake is concerned, um, I've always wondered what were Bert and Ernie supposed to be doing on the cake that gave so much offence to, uh, to the cake maker. Mm. Uh, I particularly would like to see the design drawings because I've always wondered which is the top and which is the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> The question, of, the question of whether they're gay was settled a long time ago. Yes. But <laughs> I presume uh, a rubber ducky would be involved as well. As long as rubber ducky is made of condom safe latex uh, I'm, and there's plenty of lube, I'm for it. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Harriet, uh, this was all brought about, uh, this conversation, by a plebiscite. Uh, and before that, an attack on safe government really trying to force boys into dresses. Just a couple of things there about the terminology. It wasn't a plebiscite, it was a postal survey and it was in effect the same thing as receiving an Amway catalogue in the mail where you got <laughs> to peruse the idea of giving people the same rights as everybody else in the same way that you might look at a Tupperware container or some solar lights in the shape of butterflies. So I think that's a really important <laughs> thing <laughs> to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Secondly, safe schools, and I don't know how many times we need to keep saying this, is not part of the curriculum. It's a resource designed to provide support and materials to teachers and to staff at schools where questions may be asked or information may be sought to assist with a greater understanding of what the needs are, not only for LGBTIQA plus people, but for the people around them to support them in understanding that they are loved and supported and cared for and encouraged exactly as they are. So at a state level, I was very, very proud as the first out woman in the Victorian Parliament to be the Safe Schools Ambassador. And during this postal survey, there were so many of us who went from door to door, who went from shop to shop, who had conversations, uh, including with people like Janice at the water cooler at work, around why it was that we deserved to be treated in the same way as everybody else. And it was an humiliating experience. It was something which caused a, an awful lot of pain and distress that we're still getting through. The Andrews government put half a million dollars into additional resources and support for our communities during the postal survey. We reached out and tried to do the very best that we could, but this so-called freedom of religious expression and freedom of political expression was something that came after us and has caused wounds that are still here to this day. There's a lot of healing to be done, but alongside that, there are so many of us getting married and there are so many Bert and Ernie cakes out there and we are coming for you bakers and you will make the cakes and Bertie, Ernie and Bert will both be in dresses or in tuxedos and they will be impeccably frocked up and the parties will be amazing and if you're good enough you may be invited. I do, uh, I do like that you used their celebrity couple name, Bernie, in there. Bernie and Urch. See, it's like any sort of, sort of long-term couple, right? After a while, you sort of merge into one. So you then become, I mean, I think that um, Tomcat was um, Katie Holmes and Tom Cruise. Let's never talk about them again. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many other celebrity couples, and I reckon Sesame Street's great. I'm just waiting for Big Bird, who I want to be a lesbian in denim overalls, making vegetable gardens with chicken wire and pallets, um, to then actually find something perhaps with rubber ducky into the future. Um, I think there's a, there's a market there for perhaps a Netflix series, yeah, so well, anyone who's connected with Netflix might want to get onto that. I look forward to reading your fan fiction. <laughs> yes. 
And to be clear, you, in all your door knocking, you didn't once grab a boy and force him into a dress? No, well, I was tempted to become straight just on the basis of the number of people who told me that I was an abomination. But after a while, I realised that it was probably just best to go about living my life as I am and to, uh, to encourage people to recognise and to realise that I'm actually just as boring and as mundane as everybody else. And if I <laughs> want to sit down and eat baked beans from a tin on a Thursday night while watching reruns of Q&A, well, then that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> Sometimes they're in a bowl, though, so let's just... I mean, I'm not a complete slob. Let's not just think that I've just let all of my standards... Go. If you're going to microwave them, you have to put them in a little bowl with, with glad wrap so that it doesn't spatter over the roof of the right. microwave. Sorry about that, as That's you right. were. I enjoy reading your cooking book as well. Um, <laughs> we've got two deans, uh, so are we going to go with Dean A and Dean B or Dean 1 and Dean 2? Your choice. I prefer being called Dean 1. I'm not sure about Dean 2. I'll be Dean... <laughs> I'll be Dean B. <laughs> OK, Dean 1 and Dean B. Um, <laughs> Dean 1, you're a boy who occasionally wears a dress. What do you think about that? I love it. Dresses are so comfortable. I love this whole conversation about forcing boys into dresses. If they wear them, it's because they feel really great. Yeah, like, I've got to admit, I look for more, yeah, I look for more opportunities to wear them and to, because they are the most comfortable, gorgeous-looking things. And I'm all for... Boys, girls dressing however they want, but quite frankly, it's so much more comfortable walking around Midsummer Carnival in a skirt than it is in a pair of pants with chafing. Yeah. So I'm all for it. Dress, wear them all, whatever, however you identify, put on a skirt and just look fabulous. Yeah, you just got to watch out for the chub run. Yeah, that's what I always have Vaseline with me at yeah, any time. Yeah, yeah. Well, just the odor. For whatever the reason they come up. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a lot of drama over what is essentially where you put a seam. Um, Joe, Joe, it's fair to say uh, Switchboard uh, was at the coalface, so you've witnessed the impact of this firsthand. Uh, Janice mentions she's always proud to be Australian. Has the last two years made you proud to be Australian? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, that's a question only days away from Invasion Day. So I must say I'm not proud to be Australian, but I, I think that I'm not proud to be Australian for a number of reasons. And in January, I'd say, I, until... And I, I saw this hashtag that was like... Um, uh, we don't, don't change the date, change the nation. And I think, you know, until we do that, I can't be proud to be Australian. So I would stop there. But I definitely, the marriage equality survey didn't make me feel... Um, it felt me, made me feel proud of parts of our community. I think that's right. Um, I think parts of my... I know I was, I've said this many times before. I feel like the communities that really impressed me and, and, and make me well up um, with tears is the Victorian, like, rural towns and communities and how they voted. Because I think, looking at, like, I think Ballarat had 60% yes, Ballarat, the home of George Pell, you know, where he spent some time there, um, high Catholic population, um, Bendigo had about the same. And I think these are stories that we're always told that these are places that uh, we should be afraid of, regional Victoria. And actually, the stories that came out of the Postal Server were am very amazing. And I, I felt very much proud to be part of yes. I think that was what made me feel proud of them. I was very proud to be part of Switchboard and the work that we did and the thousands and thousands of calls that we took during that time um, and, you know, to be able to be there for people during that time. Actually, a journalist asked me in the middle of the postal survey, what would you be doing... And it was sort of this provocative question about what would you be doing if there wasn't the postal survey? So the question was supposed to be like, oh, the postal survey is wasting your time. What would you be do doing instead? And I said, this is what we were born to do at Switchboard. This is what we came about in 1991, 28 years ago. We were born we were out of a need in our community for peer-based, non-clinical service provision. So these moments, whether it's um, safe schools or the postal survey, um, anti-discrimination in Tasmania in 1996, whatever it was, whatever those challenges are, these are what we're here for. So I feel proud about a lot of things. Um, and I also feel a slightly hung up on the fact that do people know that in Sydney there's only five million people? So if heaven is the size of Sydney, just <laughs> have a think about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, roughly. Oh, okay. She's not an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So it's now uh, two weeks later on the tram. Uh, and let's find out what our travellers are, are going... They're going to work this time, so let's have a listen in. 
No. No. No way. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, what a bitch. I know I've always hated her. She's, oh, she's so annoying. She never stops talking. <laughs> no, I haven't seen her since the Cher concert. You know, she was sitting right next to me. I was in P row, seat 39, and she was in P row, seat 40. And do you think that bitch would shut up? <laughs> no way. And then Cher came on. She started singing along to all the songs. You know, she started singing, I've Got You, Babe, which, you know, is my all-time favourite. And that bitch just wouldn't be quiet. In the end, I had to say to her, I think Cher might be doing a pretty good job on her own. Don't you? <laughs> yeah, she hasn't said a word to me since then. Stuck up, bitch. Anyway, Brianna. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, she's fine. Just finished a VCE. <laughs> God give me strength. <laughs> We're still sorting out all that other stuff with her. Well, you know those pictures and texts that I found on her phone to that other girl, Marcy? Yeah. Well, I got on the phone to Marcy's mother and I told her that I think her daughter is disgusting and that Brianna's not going to have anything more to do with her. I mean, it's so sick. Of course, according to Brianna, I'm the worst in the world. I mean, she tried telling me that she loves Marcy. Can you imagine? Oh. oh, well, anyway, Brian and I found the details of this conversion course where you can be cured. Yes, yes, I've signed Brianna up, and the beauty of it is that she can be all tidied up before the Easter break. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I'd better let you go. Where are you? Oh, God, it's been ages since I had my toes done. <laughs> Bye. Oh, hi, Adam. <laughs> Didn't see you there. How are you? Hi, it's Mark. I'm Mark. No? Yes, it's me. I'm Mark. How are you, Jan? Good, thanks. It's Janice. Mark, is it? Yeah, listen, I couldn't help but overhear you on the phone just then. Oh, well, that was a private conversation, actually, but all right. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of find it funny that, you know, of all the people... Oh, did you go to Cher as well? Wasn't she amazing? <laughs> what? No, I mean, yes, I did go to Cher, but... No. <laughs> when you said that thing about the conversion course, what did you mean? Oh, oh, well, um, this friend of mine, a, a very close friend, uh, she thinks or imagines that she might be a, you know, a lesbian. And I know that it's very common these days for people to imagine that. But this friend of mine, she's very young and I don't think she's ready to make that sort of choice. So, yes, there's hope because all of that's going to be, you know, sorted out. Wow. I know, right? Wow. I bet you <laughs> wish you had a conversion course when you were young. I suppose it's never too late. Okay, that's one of the most fucked up things I've ever heard. Excuse your French. No, excuse my ass, okay? And Jan, it's not a fucking choice, okay? You should make sure that your friend doesn't get wrapped up in this conversion course because those fuckwits are going to convert your money into fucking shit, okay? And ruin her life. I mean, why would you do that to her? It's Janice, actually. And Mark, I don't expect you to understand, but I'm doing it because I love her. Ooh. Bloody hell. Good on you, Mark. You don't need to, you know, excuse your ass at all. Um, so... <laughs> so, uh, Janice uh, is clearly uncomfortable revealing that her very close friend uh, is in fact her daughter, uh, who she's about to send off to get the lesbian converted out of her. Um, and she's doing it because she loves her. Uh, Kim Gates, you're a mother. Do you think parents are always trying to do the best things by their children? And how would you feel if one of your kids came out? I do think that parents are mostly trying to do the best thing for their children, but I don't think that parents always know what is best for their children. Um, I am the mother of a queer child, um, and I hopefully think I'm a very supportive mother. Um, I'm quite disappointed that I actually think that there should be conversion therapy because I've got two straight daughters and I wish they weren't. <laughs> uh, but I have heard of a drug called Lyrica that apparently makes you gay, so I might put them on that. But anyway. <laughs> uh, but I do think that parents sometimes aren't up to speed with what really they should be and be educated enough around what's going on and what's happening for their children and their generation. And I think it, as a parent, it's our responsibility to do that. Mm, mm. Um, Joe, if Janice uh, was to ring up switchboards seeking advice, uh, what would you say? We absolutely take calls from parents, mm -hmm. um, and we do take calls from 
definitely took calls from people who, who were voting no. Um, and I think that, you know, we actually welcome those calls. Uh, we welcome that people will call up and have those conversations with us. Preferably they'll have them with us rather than their children first. Um, when, they, when, the, when the arguments are just so uh, vile as what she was saying, it would be great for her to test some of those ideas against some rational uh, other opinions. Uh, but I think, you know, look, it, we, de we definitely have those conversations. Um, and they're important, I think. I and mean, I, I think it's a really interesting thing, actually, that uh, a lot of people might think that, you know, Switchboard has this kind of dualistic role that we are involved in advocacy, and we certainly are against conversion therapy, but then we have a whole kind of peer-based uh, phone and tele-web service that is open to the whole community, and is open to parents, and is open to people with all sorts of views to ring up and talk about it. Um, and we definitely want to have those conversations. I'd love to have it, well, not personally, because I don't get on the phones, but I, I, I mean, I... I feel sorry potentially for one of our volunteers that would speak to her, but I think you know this is the work that we do is that we are about um, having those conversations and having those conversations over time. I'd hope that we would talk to her many, many times and hopefully make a, a safer world and a safer family unit for her. It was it was her daughter, wasn't it? Mm. You're saying, yep, yeah, a safer world for her her daughter. Yeah. Dean B, <laughs> you've covered this issue extensively in the past. Is this a case of gays versus God? Not at all. Uh, God and gays go really well together. Uh, you only have to look at the Catholic Church. Um, <laughs> speaking of putting people in frocks, um, <laughs> grown men in frocks, forcing them to wear dresses. Um, that's an interesting concept. Forget about the kids. Um, I think the biggest issue here is where... Uh, as Janice stated very clearly, she's doing this out of love. It's a language that totally diffuses the hideousness of what they are trying to do. And by putting this blanket of love over what really is trying to transform something that is natural and beautiful and God-given, if you want to go down that path, um, it's that uh, juxtaposition that makes people in this space feel inherently broken. And that, sadly, is something that cannot be fixed when their community, their family, and their life centres around the church, they are intrinsically broken, and many mm. forever. They can kind of get through life, but none of them ever feel whole or complete until even those that have managed to let go of all of that shit, so many of them are sadly uh, don't feel whole. And that's because their entire world still thinks that they're wrong. And it's really difficult to grow up uh, as someone who can never be like their father, if that's the role model, or like their pastor, if you want. That is a role model, my God. There's oh, a concept. No, sorry, I thought you meant... Um, no, not that person. <laughs> Um, oh. That's a better role model, yeah. actually. I want to yeah. be a fettuccine. Yeah. Yeah. Give me an occhi. Um, but we're in that space, they're always not complete. They're always mm. not whole. And they can never be that yeah. because they're intrinsically broken. And it's just such a poisonous thing. It's, 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 it really breaks my heart to see it. Mm. And it continues to this day. Uh, and I think, more importantly... What we need to look at in the ex-gay space is it as an ideology. It is, the, it is the driving force behind homophobia in today's society. None of the other redneck stuff. It is the fact that uh, Christianity has told us that it, we're wrong and that drives the, uh, the Judeo-Christian belief of, of gays being uh, uh, an abomination is what drives homophobia right here, right now, in this country. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're applauding you, not homophobia. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Lee Carney, uh, should Janice have the right to force Brianna to go to conversion school? 
No, so I completely agree with what Dean said before. Parents can have lots of misguided ideas about what they think might help their kids. She could think that she could wave a wand over someone's head and make them a wizard. Doesn't actually mean that it's effective. And what we know about conversion therapy is that it is not effective. Every single reputable medical association in Australia has said this practice is harmful. This practice needs to be stopped. And we actually need our governments to stand up and take a stand against conversion therapy. Okay. Succinct. <laughs> Good. Get us back on time. Okay. Uh, we're going to flash forward to six months later. It is World AIDS Day, and our happy wanderers are back on the tram. You know, the costume change. Um, just like that uh, annoying work acquaintance that you hope you'll never see again once their farewell card is signed, Janice and Mark just keep on running into each other. So let's have a listen to what's going on. I thought it was you. <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, yeah, right, hi. <laughs> You've forgotten my name, haven't you? Uh, no, um, <laughs> I can tell. You've forgotten. No, no, don't, no, don't tell me. It's um, Jenny, isn't it? It's Janice! Oh. Janice Plackett. Janice Plackett. <laughs> That's okay. Some people are just really bad with names. But I never forget a face. I've got that kind of mind. It's like a steel trap. You're Mark. Very good, yeah. It says that on your name tag, lol. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> you should keep that on in case you get lost. <laughs> oh, no, I've just come back from a course at Thorn Harbour and just forgot to peel it off. Oh, Thorn Harbour, is that like an insurance company? Uh, no, it used to be the, it used to be the AIDS Council. They've just changed their name. AIDS? Oh, that's weird. Sounds like a family resort, doesn't it? You know, Thorn <laughs> Harbour, fun for all the family. AIDS! Oh, no, AIDS, AIDS, no. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, I was just finding out about U equals U. Oh, right, like the NBM. It is so slow in our street. It's actually unbelievable. Uh, no, NBM, that's uh, U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. It's HIV prevention. HIV, like AIDS? How does that work? No, HIV isn't AIDS, Jan, okay? HIV is a virus that can cause AIDS if you don't, like get treated, okay? U equals U is about how if someone has HIV and they're on the treatment and um, the HIV is undetectable in their blood, then, you know, they can't transmit HIV to anyone. It's impossible. It's called being undetectable. It's Janice, actually. <laughs> undetectable. So what, they're invisible. Is that what you're telling me? No, they're not invisible. HIV can't be detected in the blood, so they can't pass the HIV on, like, they, even if they don't wear a condom. People with HIV... People who have HIV not wearing condoms? Are you crazy? Some of us are old enough to remember what happened to Peter Allen, mate. I mean, you're a gay, right? If it's not on, it's not on. Now, unless you want the Grim Reaper to put his bowling shoes on again, I suggest you keep wearing condoms. Undetectable, what piffle! Right, uh, so there have been incredible advances in the prevention of HIV over the past few years. Uh, PrEP, the daily pill you can take to prevent the virus, and U equals U, the most effective way to prevent onward transmission. Dean B, <laughs> when advocating for PrEP, uh, you, are very publicly, uh, you very publicly came out as HIV positive at the time. A lot of people uh, had something to say about it. What do you think of Janice's sage advice for people with HIV? Janet needs to realise that... It's Janice. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the old tart needs to realise that this is, a very, this is a very different world that we now live in. Mm. In fact, what she is doing is perpetuating the transference of HIV. Um, you are far more likely to get HIV from someone who is negative or at least thinks they are mm. today, than you are from someone who is positive and on treatment and looking after themselves by taking their medication on a daily basis and looking after not only themselves but the entire community in the process. Mm. That alone should be enough to, uh, to scream it from the rooftops and be the antithesis of the Grim Reaper mm. campaign. Mm. Sadly, uh, our governments haven't seen fit to talk to Harold Mitchell to say, can you undo the damage you did with the previous ad campaign and can you put some of your millions back into transforming the lives of those living with HIV and, and doing a counter, uh, counterpoint to the, the campaign that he did once before. But I think it's our mums and dads and aunts and uncles that are still ill-informed uh, that 
hold uh, Michelle uh, uh, Janice's point of view um, that, that, that continues to perpetuate HIV mm. in this country at least. Mm, mm. Um, uh, Paul, uh, on that, you know, in spite of you equals you, um, what is keeping those attitudes alive in our mums and dads and aunts and uncles? Well, stigma is. HIV is an incredibly stigmatised disease. It's a disease that from the very beginning was linked to all sorts of unsavoury behaviours like gay sex, like injecting uh, drugs, like sex work. And that stigma is very, very deep. And there's a, you know, there's a stigma that goes with infectious diseases generally. And it's something we've been fighting against from the very, very beginning to try and encourage people with HIV to live openly, to talk about their experience, to, sh to be part of the solution of fighting for prevention, fighting for better treatment, keeping people alive, keeping people HIV negative, is work that HIV positive people have been doing in this country for nearly 40 years. And uh, in terms of U equals U, it is an absolutely world-changing development to know that for someone like me, who's been living with HIV for a long time, that no matter how hard I try, as long as I keep taking my pills, I'm incapable of transmitting HIV to someone else. For someone who's been living with that shadow of fear that I might pass HIV on for so long, it is such an incredible, incredible thing. I, the last time I had a detectable viral load was in the 20th century. It has been a long, long time. Uh, it was a long time coming too, and it was too long coming because we were living with the fear that we might pass HIV on for too long when the science was becoming clearer and clearer and we were being resisted by the medical establishment. And if we had not pushed for U equals U, the research would not have been done and we would not be in this position today. Dean one, uh, you've got a cool haircut. Thank you. um, you're obviously very involved in the, you know, in the community social scene. Uh, what's your take on this from that perspective? Well, I'm a little bit disappointed because we were talking about how this is a conversation, how we can educate older people and the older generations. And unfortunately, that conversation that we just witnessed is one that happens all the time in our communities with younger people. The number of people that do not understand something as simple as U equals U, something that we have posters up about, people constantly talking about, and it speaks to the fact that when it comes to HIV and AIDS, people just clamp up their ears and don't want to listen. Even though the information's all there for you to realise that you can change the way in which you stigmatise people living with HIV, the way in which you treat your attitude towards sex. But unfortunately, that conversation is one that happens across the board, across age groups, across mm. genders, and we really just have to keep... We have to just keep ploughing it, saying it over and over again. I, at least once a week, I'm having that conversation, talking to someone about U equals U every mm. single time. Did like you, you when you said you have to keep ploughing it. Well, yeah. I like that too. <laughs> um, Kim, uh, Kim, are condoms still part of safe sex in 2019? Um, I, I think so. I think people have to have choices about what they what what preventative me methods they use. And um, having lived in the Northern Territory for a long time, and um, being a strong advocate for Aboriginal health, where we have really high rates of STIs, uh, we still encourage condom use across, widely across the Northern Territory for that reason. Um, obviously, uh, we've, we've had a big syphilis outbreak across the top end of Australia that's resulted in um, um, some deaths of young babies and, you know, that's something that we definitely want to change. So I would still always advocate for condoms in that population. Mm. But there are other populations that I would suggest that PrEP and um, being on treatment are better options. So I think people need to have those choices. Yeah. Great. Okay, time marches on, and so do our travellers. It is now two months later, and once again, fate has brought Janice and Mark back together again. Oh, I wasn't sure it was you. You look like you'd passed out. No, I'm uh, just having a bit of a snooze. Oh, that's all right. It's all good, as the young people say. Oh, I'm glad I ran into you again, actually. Yeah, it's really good to see you too. It's, um, uh, Janice. Janice. Yes, I wanted to give you an update on Brianna. Who? 
Brianna, my daughter, Brianna. Remember I told you I was sending her off to gay conversion school? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's wrong, you should say. Turns out it was a complete waste of money. Brianna was born gay. <laughs> Must have been all that sushi I ate when I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, it's too late now. Brian and I are trying to get our money back. <laughs> anyway, but uh, Brian and I met a lovely girl at the conversion school, Lynn, and they're going to barista school together and I'm doing a course at PFLAG. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, it's great. You learn all about coffee and how to make your cappuccinos and your mochaccinos and your flat whites and your long blacks and your macchiatos. No, 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 I mean PFLAGs. A... They're great. Oh, yes, 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 it is. It's interesting. You get to get together with others and learn all about the, the rainbow people. <laughs> the only thing I can't get my head around are the gender ones. The what? You know, the, the gender people. You mean non-binary, like yeah. genderqueer? Yes, yes, yes. Um, the catch-all category for gender identities that are not exclusively masculine or feminine, identities which are outside the gender binary or cis normativity. Apparently that's what I am. Cis normative. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <Yeah. laughs> Not me. Gender queer people uh, may express a combination of masculinity and femininity or neither in their gender expression. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. And trans people are people that have a gender identity or expression that differs from their um, assigned sex at birth. Yeah, top marks, Jan. Well done. <laughs> it's Janice, actually. <laughs> yeah. It is so interesting, though. I mean, things are changing very fast. I saw there was a man in Parliament the other day and uh, he wanted to talk about abortion. It was on the Channel 9 News. Anyway, people said he couldn't do that, had no right to. But then he said, well, I'm a woman, and demanded the right to speak about it. Oh, no, no, that's not trans or genderqueer. That's just some idiot in Parliament with a big mouth. Yeah, well, then I thought, well, if that's that easy, I might just insist that I'm a man when I go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, why not? I've been plugging away for years trying to get a raise. Maybe if I say I'm a man, I'll get one in a snap. You were doing so well, Janice. <laughs> well, at least we are living in times that recognise that gender isn't fixed, I suppose. Uh, that people are free to recognise and understand their own destinies. It is a brave new world, but Janice is correct. Barry O'Sullivan did claim uh, to be a woman and demand that people in Parliament recognise him as such so he could speak on abortion. Maybe I misgendered. Anyway, uh, in the current moment... How do we deal with rank opportunists like Mr. O'Sullivan? Uh, Zoe, Barry is married to a woman. Does this mean that Barry is a lesbian? Uh, and would you welcome Barry into the sisterhood? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, before I answer that, I do just want to say, I, I don't know about you guys, but Janice is really growing on me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, her politics are fucked up, but she's got a certain pizzazz. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lol. Barry... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jenny. But uh, Barry, I don't know about Barry. Um, I feel I'm on to Barry. Uh, I mean, you can't just Rachel Doldale your way into the queer community. But um, no, I think Barry. I mean, I I feel like if Barry were really part of my sisterhood, he would, for starters, he would know that uh, abortion isn't a woman's issue. It's a, an issue for people with uteruses, um, not all of whom are women. Um, so, <laughs> ding, ding, your, show, your, your sisness is showing, Barry. But... Um, uh, the sisterhood, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't right. really work when you no, say that loud, yeah. though, does it? Yeah. <laughs> good for a placard yeah. but um, <laughs> no but I mean I'm not no gender essentialist so yes I would accept Barry into my lesbian sisterhood but um, only if he does what all other lesbians have to do which is to pass the tests the you know and trials of the seven wonders as set by the grand high witch <laughs> uh, <laughs> walk through you know you walk through the fire you have to recite all the you know the entire of Xena uh, episodes. <laughs> yeah. 
and you know, and then you you know you carry the L word box set across yeah. <laughs> a whole lot of golden retrievers wearing yeah. neckerchiefs, yeah. rescues obviously. And then there's, and the, there's, <laughs> there's that sphinx that says um, you've got to answer the question about whether they're flirting or, or just complimenting you. Yeah, and yeah. then you're like, aren't you my ex? And it's like, of course you are. We're still friends. <laughs> and. <laughs> And then, of course, yes, he can come to the party. Okay. If Barry O'Sullivan really wants to be a woman, he should join the exodus of liberal women who are quitting Parliament and fuck right off. Nailed it. Harry, is this sort of political opportunism, is, is it rare, these shenanigans? This tomfoolery. It is, it is Thomasina foolery, isn't it? Just to extend that out to mm. be more inclusive as a social term. Just before we get onto that, can I just say, and I have to, but as soon as anyone mentions the L word, I just automatically start hating on Jenny Schechter, and I can't stop. So that might affect the way in which I answer this question. So. Uh, I think that there is rank political opportunism everywhere and it's in commerce and it's in our parliaments and it's in our everyday and I think that one of the things that's really uh, made people detest politicians with the vigour and the, the sheer energy that we've seen in recent times has been the, the enormous disconnectedness between people who are elected to do a public service in representing the communities uh, who put them there in the first place, even if you're a Fraser Anning and you only got 19 votes in the first place. We'll pop that one to one side. Uh, the, the challenge is uh, that politicians need to be held to account for these sorts of incredibly disrespectful approaches to political tactics that have no regard for dignity or for respect or conversely for the sort of hurt that they cause. And I do know that um, after this, this, this Barry uh, claim came to light. It, it was the same sort of response for me uh, in, in my office in relation to the calls that uh, a certain flame-headed um, member of One Nation created when she decided to put on a burqa and test the security arrangements at Parliament House. And this is a reason why people think that politicians are out of touch and egotistical and unable to deliver. There is a disconnect there. I think it's I think it's beyond reprehensible in the context of the hurt that it creates. And again, when we see that politicians, um, and I, I'd say more up in Canberra than in Melbourne because I'm from Melbourne and obviously I'd want to sort of self-preserve to, to a certain extent uh, around my own <laughs> reputation, so knock that one up to selfishness. But in, in Canberra, the way in which there's, there is a, a, almost a willful blindness uh, to engage with the needs of constituents and engage on social issues and actually reflect what the community wants rather than lagging behind at some point in the 1940s while you think that recreating a tour embarked upon by James Cook is a fantastic way to spend six million dollars when meanwhile we've got some fish pickling themselves in the sun because no one could work out where to put the water. These are the sorts of things that mean that people are resentful. They're the sorts of reasons that cause enormous voter turnout and I think that that's absolutely right. We have to get a better sense of um, authenticity from our politicians and we also have to, have to get a, a more mature approach to issues which have a very, very real impact when they're considered on the ground once decisions are implemented or even in the course of what is apparently a throwaway line. And if Scott Morrison gave even one shred more uh, consideration to his outfits uh, and his white sneakers than uh, as he did to some of the, the core about kids being kids, I think what we would see is a much better dressed current Prime Minister, which would in fact be an improvement for everything and everyone, but we'd also see a greater standard um, in parliamentary behaviour and I think that that leaves a lot to be desired and I think that there's a long way to go and I can't wait for the federal election. Harry has just given us a lecture on integrity and authenticity in politics and yet your lot were the, the red shirts, like trying to Trying to, uh, you know, do oh, us all. What were we trying to do? Oh, do you will in? So let's just clarify that. Let's go off script for a second because this is what we call robust discussions. Watch along. Walk with I'm us. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> right. 
So, the Ombudsman investigated this particular matter and found no findings of bad faith by any of the MPs involved. Found that I'm all of the money... I'm talking about the pub tip, though. It's not going to pass the pub tip. I'm talking about what was legally found. Yeah, all right. Yeah? In the meantime, <laughs> what we currently have... how we interpret our politicians on their level of integrity and authenticity. In the meantime, and I, I, I grant you the right to interrupt, but I also take up the right to respond. Uh, what we have here... <laughs> You've got 10 seconds. Yeah, no, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. What we have here is a very interesting interjection that's taken us off course from this particular issue, noting that Victoria Police are currently investigating the Liberal Party for an equivalent blue shirts rorts, and we'll hopefully see some outcomes on that in the near future, and also welcoming the opportunity to clarify the rules which is currently being worked through the Victorian Parliament, and I'd be pleased to take this offline with you at any time you should choose. <laughs> right. Back to, back to Barry. <laughs> that was all very interesting, but I actually want to put to you that actually what he did connected with a lot of people, and that is actually the problem. There is huge parts of our own community, and definitely some of you in this room who are not convinced about transgender rights, that you are still in contest about those ideas, in our own, very own community that has adopted the LGBTI acronym. And I actually think what was most dangerous about what he did is that a lot of people went, yeah, right on, right on. That's how, that's, that's exactly what it's like to be transgender, is that you just one day, you just pop up and you just say it and then you get, I don't know, what do you get? I don't know, a right, well, it's what? very confusing what you get, but um, well, I, think I would Clayton say, um, was doing that I would say some, well. what you do get is some hate crime and all that, oh, but that wasn't what happened to him. But I actually think at the moment we're in this really interesting political moment where actually the rights, the, the legal rights we have in Victoria and some of the transgender rights we have throughout Australia have outstripped community, what the community understands and supports around transgender rights. And the challenge to us all is actually to bring the community up to speed. And I think it, that moment when he did that, and same as the moment when Pauline Hanson put on a burqa, it was the same thing. There was a lot of people sitting around Australia going, yeah, that's a really good point, Pauline. That's why she's in Parliament. And the same as the moment when he stood up and he said, I'm a woman, is that people thought, yeah, too right, that is that joke. And that there's going to be some people here who thought that that is a legitimate point of view. So I think the question, though, is... is, is the role of leadership and, the, and what side you want to be on when you're in the LGBTI community or what side you want to be on progressive thought and what side you want to be on for human rights. And what we do know is that um, transgender women are the most uh, vilified, um, you know, and the, uh, the hate crime against them, you know, some of the modest statistics are one in three transgender women yeah. have um, violent crimes perpetuated against them. Um, most transgender women report that they have uh, psychological and um, verbal abuse perpetuated against them in their life. Um, and I think that the question around, around is, is on all of us to stand up against that and not actually to say, Barry, you're an outlier. It's actually you are emblematic of the bigotry that, is, that runs around this issue and it is a red flag for us to go out and do something about it. Yeah. Um, no, you're absolutely right. It's very easy to see these characters as, as laughable and as characters, but they do reflect sentiments that are very real and very dangerous. Uh, also, you've just completely answered the question I was going to ask you. Um, so, good on you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not even necessary. I uh, don't need to be here. One, just... one in five million. Do you think that, that little rant? Yeah, okay. yeah. I wonder if heaven has a shire. <laughs> the Cronulla in heaven. <laughs> Cronulla in heaven. Did you know my name? Um, there's Cronulla in heaven. <laughs> we got there, we got there. I had, I had extra time because I didn't get to ask the question. Anyway, um, it's two months later. Janice didn't get her raise. And in the last two months, her husband has left her. She's embarking on a journey into the weird and wonderful world of online dating. 
Of course, Mark is an old hand at the digital hookup. Can he offer any guidance? Oh, bugger. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, I swiped left when I think I meant to swipe right. Tinder? Janet, I didn't know... It's well, Janice. Has... It's Janice, actually, and Brian and I have separated. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's really sad when things fall apart, right? But I guess you can still be friends, hey? Brian's a hateful prick with foul breath and fat fingers. <laughs> and after 25 years of marriage, he left me for his 22-year-old personal trainer. What can I say? Right. to for my profile, so Brianna, my daughter Brianna, helped out. <laughs> okay, what did you say? Oh, read it. Um, I'm an Aquarius with a Scorpio rising. <laughs> <laughs> I hate risotto. I love long walks on the beach, Sharon, Casey Chambers. I'm a fiercely patriotic Australian. I'm broad-minded, but I hate modern art, Federation Square, <laughs> and tinned passion fruit. I'm a single mum with three kids who loves life. I'm a little bit naughty and I'm up for a tumble. Why not get in touch? <laughs> wow, that's a really good profile pic. Yeah, captures my fun side. <laughs> that's me dressed as a rabbit last Easter with the kids. <laughs> it's funny though, I've been getting a lot of attention from men who also like to dress up as animals. <laughs> I just haven't had a chance to get back to them all. Oh, well, you don't have to. Really? Yeah, on my, prof my profile, I'm just really honest. I just, I don't want to waste anyone's time. Oh, what do you mean exactly? Well, I'm just like upfront. I'm just no nonsense. I say looking up for good times, no one over 40, thanks, no fats, no fams, no rice, and no deodorant because I like my men to smell like men. Really? You put all that on your profile? You don't want fat people? What's a femmes? Oh, it's like a, an effeminate queen, like um. Oh, and no rice. Well, I suppose I understand that because I hate risotto. But then I, <laughs> I do quite like fried rice. I mean, that can be very nice with a bit of pork and pineapple. Oh, no, 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 no. But no rice is not like rice. Like no Asians. I'm just not attracted to Asians. Are you for real? That's like racism. Uh, no, it's not. It's just a preference. And plus, you know, I'm just saying what I liked. You said you hate risotto. Anyway, I thought you said you were a very patriotic Australian in your profile. Yes, Martin, I am a very patriotic Australian who believes in a fair go for all. Your fats, your femmes, and your Asians. You want to go on dates with stinky white guys. <laughs> you should try Brian. <laughs> but you know, I think that you are a bit of a racist. Okay, dates. <laughs> Janice hates risotto. <laughs> and Mark won't hook up with anyone who is Asian, uh, but says that it's just a preference. Dean Beck, does this make Mark a sexual racist? I didn't have to do it in that voice, but I did. <laughs> Se sexual racist. Uh, it's a character. It, 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 well, it just makes him racist. But uh, I find it fascinating that he said he's really clear in his profile as to what he wants. Actually, he was very clear in what he doesn't want, mm -hmm. not in what he does want. And I've always found that being very clear in what you do want um, does work out better for you in your profile. Um, no, he's just uh, a pig. <laughs> and not in a good way. <laughs> just let's be clear. Uh, Paul, is it possible to express preferences like this without being offensive? I love it when people put stuff like no fats, fans and, race and uh, Asians in their profile because it makes it so easy to just quickly block them and move on. Because... 
who has the time to even flirt with those losers? Seriously, the world is full of amazing men. Men are so fucking hot and there are so many of them and a lot of them are Asian, fat and or femme and they are amazing in bed. So, <laughs> I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Because I was remembering you. So I'll put you down for a risotto? <laughs> put you down for the risotto and I'll also have some of the Lebanese and a bit of the Greek, please. <laughs> oh, Mediterranean. Um, <laughs> Dean A. Um, so what about other uh, Mark's other preferences? Um, you know, how do we address issues of Asia, uh, Asians? Asians. Okay. I'm in it, I've done it, I've done it now. <laughs> How do we address ageism and fat shaming in our community? Well, badly would be the first answer I have to that. We address yeah. it really badly. When it comes to things like profiles, it's quite funny. Recently, I, um, the Christmas period is always my time. The festive season is where I decide to update every single profile I have, mm. and there's a few of them. And I go through and really change them all and redefine how I'm expressing myself and what I want. And I was telling everyone that I was doing it, and because now I've hit 40, uh, so I'm in You're the, 40, I'm 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. So I'm on the wrong side of the age for everyone, apparently, according to what they want in their profiles. I mean, I'm not Asian, but I'm definitely fat and femme, so there we go. But. I actually started, and I started telling all my friends I was doing this, and we actually had a night where I went through all of my friends' profiles and completely changed them. And Dean brought up a really good point. His profile just said everything he didn't like, not everything that he wanted. And this is the nightmare of online dating, though, is the fact that people think an age means anything. It doesn't mean a damn thing. Your size or your age means nothing. I'm really clear on my profiles. Like, I want to get off offline. I want to get off offline and get off in bed. It's just the last thing I want to do is actually spend more time chatting. If I want to get to know you, let's just meet up, have a drink, figure it out, and get off the phones as quickly as possible. Of course, I'm sitting alone 90% of the time because I freak people out <laughs> with that. But the more uh, direct and aggressive, the better, I say. Okay, cool. You know what I learned the other day? That a hairless bear is called a baba. Really? Yeah. No, I just made that up, but I'm trying to... <laughs> oh my God! I'm trying to make it a thing. Let's, so if you can start, it, you heard it first. start, you know, just just have a wax and call yourself a baba. Um, that would be great. Just get it out there, make it make it a thing, and then I can be like, I'm I'm I made that up. It's just off the cuff. Some it doesn't always land. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Harriet. Hello. Does government have a role to play in combating ageism and fat shaming? Yes. Fundamentally. Government is one of the tools that's really important in having legislation that actually calls out and creates penalties for um, inappropriate behaviour. But again, you can't legislate against tools. Bottom line, if people are going to be horrible human beings, there will always be a level of engagement that again creates hurt or humiliation that, that causes people to feel shame or despair. And government has a role in some, some component of the way in which we encourage good behaviour and uh, crack down on and recognise and name bad behaviour. But importantly, when we look at um, things like the, the, um, the, this, this example on the, on the tram here, and it's great to be seeing how, how frequently the trams have been operating tonight and how reliable uh, <laughs> and comfortable they appear to be getting everyone to their destination on time. Right, enough of that. <laughs> Written and authorised by a Victorian Labor government. Mm -hmm. All right, let's stop that because... because ding, ding. That's right, ding ding. Um, so, so one of the things that we have seen tonight though is the repeated misnaming of the characters in this particular sketch. And this has, has 
to my mind, actually raised one of the key issues that has caused a lot of trauma and pain and despair and dismay across our trans community in particular, with misgendering and misnaming people in a way that causes ongoing despair that results in a greater level of pain and that that itself can then culminate in greater levels of depression, suicidal ideation and the, the, um, the way in which trans people are so uh, much more represented in the figures of people who desperately need support, often don't get it and who so often uh, take their own lives because they need and reach out for and call for but do not get the level of recognition that enables them to feel as though they have, uh, they have a society and a community around them that acknowledges and respects them for who they are. So I think that in that sense, the work that government does is particularly important where we can create tools and resources that in our workplaces and in accessing services and in the filling out of forms, these things can change over time. And one of the things that I was so uh, dismayed and upset about in the last parliament uh, was the fact that we attempted to get through changes to the birth, deaths and marriages legislation to enable people to uh, not be restricted to binary gender nominations uh, and that was defeated and it was defeated because uh, of again that rank political opportunism that I think was about a hard dragged to the right, um, but it was also um, something that caused immense pain. And so I think government has a huge role to play in this space. We're not there yet, no, no, but, the the fact the, yeah. Yeah, but the fact that we are getting somewhere and the fact that we now have a new parliament uh, that is much more convincingly about a mandate, and that speaks volumes perhaps to how much people cared about the red shirts debate at the end of the day, the numbers that we have now would tend to indicate that we have a much greater chance of getting through legislation that delivers on an equality agenda that removes discrimination from our statute books. Because every time people uh, have an experience of being other, of being humiliated, of being distressed, of being discriminated against, whether it's in our criminal code or our civil code, or whether it's about the way in which you fill out a form. That's the aggregate damage that causes us to feel less about ourselves. And over an entire lifetime, that's an enormous amount of pain, and so many people don't recover from it or live through it. And that's our tragedy to bear, and that's why we have to keep going now until we actually get the job done, do it, why, do it correctly. <laughs> Kim, uh, this phenomenon of exclusion, in, uh, does this happen in other communities or is this mostly just amongst gay men? Uh, no, I do think it happens in other, in other communities. I've, I've certainly seen um, it happen to Aboriginal people, mm -hmm. obviously, whether they're gay or straight. Um, they're certainly excluded on dating, rap, uh, on dating apps and mm -hmm. the racism is very present. Um, and I'm, yeah, um, definitely think it probably happens across other communities as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. One community in particular, Zoe, uh, do lesbians mask prejudice with preferences too? No. Yeah, no, we do. <laughs> 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 Um, as such, we're incapable of prejudice. Uh, <laughs> beaten out of us during the initiation rites. Uh, <laughs> no, of course, of course. I think, um, I mean, I haven't been in the game for quite a few years, but uh, I think lesbians, like anyone, uh, do m mask their, their prejudices um, with, with preference, and which is bollocks, of course. I mean, the, the lesbian community, I think, has a history with, you know, trans exclusion exclusionary radical feminists of being like, Boo. Boo. we don't like them. Um, they, b b being like that, but that's not my, that, uh, that's not my community, I don't feel. You know, sisterhood, not sisterhood, still doesn't work um, mm. when no, you say you it gotta... out loud. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but um, I was sort of, um, so, so yes, the answer is yes, they do. Um, uh, but I, I think it's a pretty easy thing to spot and I think it's a pretty easy thing to, like you said, um, you know, just to go, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. But someone I do want to have something to do with is Janice. She is killing it. <laughs> uh, go Janice. I feel I backed her at the beginning, you know, and 
we're, we're all a bit iffy on her. She didn't have great odds, but she's uh, she's coming through. So I just yeah. want to say I'm uh, pretty happy with the choices I made of who I was going for uh, early <laughs> in this competition. Right. Yeah, it is a competition. Yeah. I was actually wondering, you know, I sort of put out the call to Janice that she should call Switchboard. And I was wondering, you know, we've seen the journey she's gone on. Yeah. So maybe she's been calling regularly. I think she's talking yeah, about I mean, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, just having the conversations, transforming people. Yeah. Janet is woke. Yeah, getting woke. <laughs> All right. Uh, three months have gone by and our travellers haven't seen each other. Then, one Monday morning, this happens. Oh, hello. It's you. No. I nearly didn't recognise you. Hi, Janet. How are you going? It's Janice, actually. <laughs> look at you, Michael. You look like you work in a bank. <laughs> it's Mark. Oh, I've just come back from Canberra. My partner works there. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. Is he, a, is he a, a poly or something? Oh, no, he's actually quite high up. He actually works with Scott Morrison. Oh, right. Who is he? Well, I can't say who he is. It's sort of top secret. Would I know? Has he yeah. been on the Channel 9 News? I can't tell you, you know. We want to keep it quiet. I, I met him online, but I can show you a picture. Oh, actually. great. Oh, that's a bit full on. Oh, he seems very tall. His head's cut off. Is he a nerdist? Oh, fuck, give me that back. <laughs> no, not that. This picture. Oh, him. Right. Yeah. Oh, but hang on. Isn't he sort of married to, like, a woman? Oh, yes, yeah, sort of. But she just doesn't really understand him. She doesn't understand that he's gay and having gay sex with you. Yeah, <laughs> she just wouldn't get it. And, you know, we're only doing it just for the sake of his family. How old are his kids? 26 and 28, so his kids have kids, but we just want, don't want to confuse them. Mm. Oh, but isn't he the one that was against the whole gay marriage thing? I mean, you were big on that, weren't you? You never shut up about it. <laughs> And isn't he against pill testing too? And I think he also said something about gay refugees not needing asylum. He's yeah. that one, isn't he? I mean, he's very old fashioned, but his heart's in the right place. And he's a great fuck. He got me this jacket. Makes you look like a real estate agent. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Brianna, my daughter Brianna, she said that he's the one that thinks it's fine for Catholic schools to not hire gay teachers and so on. Yeah, that's right, but he's just really into his faith, you know. And anyway, how does Brianna know about that? Isn't she like a barista? Oh, she's left that job now. Now she works on that show, The Project, on <laughs> Channel 10. Oh, she'd love to know about your new squeeze. No! All right, well, uh, Mark has raised some very interesting issues here. A high-profile conservative politician who takes positions that are actively against the interests of LGBTI people, uh, who also happens to be closeted. Uh, Dean A, should Janice give Brianna the scoop of a lifetime? Look, it's tough, but absolutely not. There's no. never a right way, to, there's never a good reason to out someone in that way. There's ways in which you, uh, unfortunately in the times that we live, especially the journalist times that we live, 24-7 tw news media, really short articles with lots of gifs in them so that they don't really need to mean anything. Getting that information, putting that out there really quickly, being able to shame him would be really great, but there needs to be a bigger responsibility to it. You do also have journalistic ethics that you need to stand by. It doesn't mean you certainly can't tilt a certain way in what you do and how you do it and should, but it's never okay to out a person, especially in public media. Yeah, I already picked the gifts. Um, <laughs> Dean Beck, uh, if you received this tip, <laughs> would, <laughs> would, would you out him in the media? Mm. I don't have much time for political pundits who are uh, hypocrites. I'm very impressed by Janice being uh, totally not interested in politics but knowing everything that this guy gets up to. Um, that impressed me. But uh, when you take a tough stand against uh, elements of the community and you are a total hypocrite, 
I find that tough to swallow. So I would probably get evidence before, my own evidence before, mm -hmm. um, was it Channel 7 that did a sting on a politician that went into a sauna once? Um, sat out the front of the sauna until he went into it? It has happened previously. Mm. I'd get evidence. Okay, okay. Uh, Joe, uh, are you okay with this politician being outed? Oh, this, this is, um, this is one of, uh, probably, and you, you know, like, just thinking about, this is a really point of tension for me, I guess, um, because of, but I think that I come up on the side of thinking about our community and the deep, if somebody is exhibiting deep hypocrisy and harming our community, uh, I think, because what comes to mind as parallel to this is Barnaby Joyce and Andrew Broad, right? Mm -hmm. what, that's the other thing that happened about whether you should have privacy around their affairs. And I think, like, in those cases, both of those people campaigned so hard on heterosexual monogamy um, as the cornerstone of our society. And I think in that instance, I was, it was just so clear about that they needed to... They had no right to privacy because the pure hypocrisy that they had been having those affairs while they'd been running that campaign um, needed to come out and it needed to be tried in the public eye. I think there is a different thing for politicians. I think in this actual instance, I mean, outing was a really big politics that we, you know, we've, we've had consistently in our community and it's very complicated politics. Um, and because there, there is different people, I think, I, I think, um, we can think of um, uh, Justice Kirby, right, yeah. and what he went yeah. through and his outing. And I did not support yeah. that and not support what happened with that. I was completely on his side. But he did not build a career on tearing other people's relationships and lives apart. So I think, you know, in that instance, like when somebody would be so, like the instance of um, Mark's <laughs> boyfriend, um, you know, I don't think, I think it's quite similar to Barnaby Joyce and Andrew I think it's they don't deserve that privacy mm. and I think if it comes out it comes out and it, it, it needs to be discussed because they're just so embroiled in the idea they have built a, a, a career on morality and that needs to be not to mention like the idea of like um, like the queer refugees and like everything you know the, 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 that instance there I don't have any sympathy and I don't think I'd have any sympathy if he was outed and I, and I understand that's completely yeah controversial, but I do think there are a higher accords for people who hold public office um, than, than other positions in our society. Mm. There's a way to highlight that someone's a hypocrite without, though, without outing them, uh, and that's, yeah. that's the thing with yeah. that. There is definitely highlighting the hypocrisy. I, I was just thinking as you were talking about it, just within our own communities, uh, when celebrities come out that necessarily have said previously that they're not gay for whatever reason in previous times of their careers and the way in which they're treated within our own communities isn't necessarily a positive thing. So highlighting the hypocrisy, absolutely, but outing them, we've got to remember what that was like for us as well mm. and what that means. I think thinking about like, what comes there with Ian Thorpe, right, the way he was treated, I was mm. completely on his side. He has a right, complete right to privacy around that. But he also, his swimming had nothing, his whole public life had nothing to do with who he was having sex with. Same with Magda Sabansky, like uh, she was closeted for many years, um, she needed to have, and she deserved, and she had the right to come out when she wanted to come out. And I think that's not what I'm talking about, I'm not talking about those public figures, I'm talking about those people who openly, like George Pell, as an example, um, of somebody who builds their life on, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about this, am I? in a public forum. Um, but, you know, say somebody like that. No, okay. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, well, you know, okay. It's hypothetical. Yeah, it's hypothetical. Yeah. Say yeah. if there was somebody who was in Rome. Okay, no, right, okay, um, doesn't matter. And, um, but, you know, what I mean is that I think when there's that... They have spent their lifetime and their career and it is just such in, in, in contrast. Um, I, just don't, I just don't have any sympathy for it. Yeah. And, and I, I think we can be nuanced about this without treating it like a sledgehammer of like it's, it's wrong, it's always wrong. Hmm. Look, I, I think it might be a controversial position, but if I could go back in time, I would out baby Hitler. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I really, really disagree. I love all you guys, but I would out the fucker. I mean, <laughs> it's okay to punch Nazis and it's okay to out homophobes. Mm. Would it be any... You know, this person, this is someone who is actively 
fighting against our rights, who is actively, you know, turning, uh, uh, making queer children and trans children feel less, actively, actively working against it. It's our job to make the world a better place. And if we have to take some casualties along the way, then we take them. And if, we, if, if in the circumstance we've got a married gay politician who's living a secret life and voting against us, to, you know, saying that gay asylum seekers aren't, uh, aren't genuine, something that happened on this stage in this event a few years ago from a, a, an out liberal politician. No, out the fucker. Um, Harriet, uh, how is it being an out politician? Um, what about when it means towing a party line well, that doesn't have the best Well, this is not hypothetical interest? anymore all of a sudden, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Righto. Um, interesting question. Thank you, John, for asking that. Just swap um, back at me. I, no, no, no. Good, good <laughs> prompt. Um, so I just want to start with the question that preceded this one. I had such a painful experience coming out and I had such a difficult set of conversations that meant that even today, even now, even on the stage at Midsummer, saying I'm the first out lesbian in the Victorian Parliament is something that I have to practice. I have to practice pride. And for a lot of people, pride is something that comes much more easily than for others of us. And to go to the question about outing, I look at what the, que the, the problem is. The problem is that we have a, a terrible human being who is undertaking actions that are actually causing huge, huge, uh, again, pain and, and, um, and disruption and dismay and, and all sorts of difficulty for people's lives. And yet, on the other hand, I look at what perhaps sits underneath all of that and I ask myself, how would I want to be treated in a situation, irrespective of the fact that you know, um, this person may be saying and doing terrible things? Who I am is something that has, has taken me a long time to accept. And it took many years for me to come to terms with who I am. And I was offered gay conversion therapy along the line. And you know, I, I still can't build IKEA furniture, but I am definitely still a lesbian. And I did want to say, <laughs> And that's probably one of the seven rights as well. I think that if you can't build a Billy bookcase in under 15 minutes, then, you know, you don't, you don't deserve the Subaru. So, <laughs> so I think that, that, that being in, in a line of firsts is always a really challenging exercise. And what I keep coming back to in the work that, that I try to do in Parliament is to be as much myself as I can possibly be. And that means that I've stood up in Parliament time after time and spoken about safe schools and howled my eyes out and talked personally about what it means to be considered other and to be spoken about or, um, or treated as though I am not good enough. And I look at that and I see that we have so much further to go. And in that sense, one of the things that has been enormously comforting and incredibly helpful along the way has been the work that, that people from our communities have been doing for decades and for centuries and for generations in pushing back against everything that says that they are not good enough. And I look to the fact that in 2021 we're having a really big pride event here in Melbourne um, and we're, we've funded this and we're putting money into this and it's 40 years since the decriminalisation of homosexuality and that's what that will actually enable us to come together with. And I see that the flip side of shame is pride and I see that on this tram in the 1970s, it could have been the same tram where two women held hands and were prosecuted for doing so. And I look at the historic, the, the apology for historic um, homosexual convictions and what that apology meant when I was in that chamber and turned around to the gallery to find scores of people just crying because of what it meant and noting that there were so many others who weren't there, who had lived their entire lives and died with that shame and the shame hanging over their families of a conviction for being who they were. So I would say, and as a politician, see, I've just given you a 7,000 word answer when you're probably looking for a tweet, but, <laughs> but what I would say is that it's, 
bloody hard, but it's really important as well because if it then makes it easier for politicians and for people within our communities who come after us to be themselves, if it's then easier to have a parliament or a community organisation or a school or a workplace which is more diverse and is about more than tolerance, it's about acceptance, then that's a really important step. And if that means that I've um, helped to make a contribution along the way, then the pain that I've experienced as part of that will have been worth it. Thanks. Well done. Zoe, um, when this news breaks about this closeted politician, what's your reaction? What do you get up to? Uh, my reaction is, firstly, what a journey we have been on with Janice <laughs> and, <laughs> and Mark. But um, <laughs> um, my reaction to this uh, is, well, I, I think two reactions. Like whenever. Whenever someone does, occasionally someone will get out of something or like whenever a conservative politician is, is doing something hypocritical and gay, um, it's kind of, my reaction is sort of half, it's partly delighted schadenfreude and also like, yeah, but you can't sit with us. Uh, <laughs> But in this particular case, I think my response is like, oh my God, this is exactly like when Alice and Tasha went to the Velvet Mafia party and Alice outed that uh, homophobic sportsman in season five of The L Word. And I still hate Jenny Schechter. <laughs> <laughs> hating. So uh, badly hating over here. Sorry. As that, that's fine. Uh, she's the villain of the show. I think you're correct in... Uh, in hating them. Uh, so that would be my official okay. response. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, <laughs> what a journey we've been on with, it's, it's actually right down here, uh, with our commuters. It's now 12 months after the last time they ran into each other. Let's listen as they meet up one last time. Oh, Mark. God, I haven't seen you on the tram for ages. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Janice. Thanks, since you've ruined my life. Oh, come on. You know, I read all those new idea articles you got paid all that money for about you and what's-his-name after he got kicked out of Canberra. <laughs> Lol! Yeah, well, that bastard. <laughs> and what a bastard. I mean, he just wouldn't leave his wife. Well, see, you're better off out of it. Just like me and that turd Brian. You know, I think Cher said it best, Mark Barker. Do you believe in life after love? <laughs> oh, Jesus, Janet Plackett. I mean, if I could turn back time. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you off to now? Oh, I'm off to the movies. I'm going to see a musical, La La Land. Oh, I can't stand those shows where all of a sudden comes some music out of nowhere and all the characters start singing for no reason. It's so cheesy. <laughs> they say we're young and we don't know. I guess that we'll find out we go along. Well, I don't know if that's all true, but you've got me and they. I've got you, babe. I've got you, babe. I've got you, babe. Well, folks, please, a round of applause for Andrea Powell and Patrick Silva. And please leave the applause going for all of our panellists tonight. Thank you so much for coming along. Good night. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.